Hello and welcome to another edition of American Racing Snobs. Eric Morse alongside Tony Rizzuti coming at you from Motor Racing Network, worldwide headquarters in Concord, North Carolina. And we have got an action-packed, jam-packed show for you this week. Uh, We're going to talk about the Brazilian Grand Prix coming up, give you a little preview there. Uh, We're also going to have our much-anticipated discussion-slash-debate about who is the greatest Grand Prix driver of all time. This has been a couple weeks in the making. Uh, We're going to work in some of your opinions as well into that conversation. Can't wait to get to that. But, Tony, guess what I did yesterday? What would you do? I went to a movie. Uh, I know where this is going. I saw Ford versus Ferrari. How was it? It was good. It was very good. I I highly recommend it. If you're a race fan, it's a must-see. I don't think it's quite as good as as Ron Howard's effort for Rush, uh-huh. but it is close. It's almost on that same level. I don't think it's going to have the same like wide ranging appeal to non racing fans that Rush might uh, for an outsider. But for people who are listening to this show, it's going to be a must watch. Uh, when I heard about the story and who was going to be in it, the first thing I was hoping was one. This is going to be a love letter to the Ford GT. And two, I hope they give Ken Miles the long overdue credit. Uh, if you don't know Ken Miles, you will know all about him if you go see this movie. It's it's really a kiss on the mouth to the legacy of Ken Miles with a lot of just car pornography in it. The, the GT40s, oh boy, the wow, Ferraris. That was a, that was, there was a lot right there. A kiss on the mouth and pornography all in the same sentence. Yeah, I probably should have put some distance between yeah, those two thoughts, but hey, it's it's Wednesday, I'm feeling punchy. <laughs> what can I say? Uh the movie's fantastic. Um it's a little bit on the long side. I think it clocks in just under two and a half hours. Uh I will give this one spoiler. They did such an awesome job recreating vintage Le Mans uh with sets and using uh roads, I believe in Georgia, I think was the set, but it I believed I was in 1960s France for most of that. And uh, the the stuff they shot at Willow Springs, it it looks so authentic until they tried to recreate the 1966 Rolex 24 at Daytona at Auto Club Speedway. Oh my God! It, you it, mentioned that you had you'd I seen it I, in a teaser, I and you were I hoping saw, maybe yeah. that wasn't what it was. Uh it's they should have just cut that from the movie. There there are a couple ways around. I don't want to spoil too much for everybody. That was the only thing as a, a as a racing snob. That really offended my sensibilities. I thought that Christian Bale was fantastic as Ken Miles. Uh, Matt Damon as Carol Shelby. Uh, totally believed it. The details in the cars were fantastic. Go see it. You'll enjoy it, even if you have to suspend your disbelief for the 24 hours of Fontana. Mm. Looking, uh. looking forward to that, though. That's that's definitely on my Why is my mic all... It's all wonky here today. You got, you got to get yourself sorted. It's you, like you need a, a front end alignment. Usually, it's so loud it about kills me. And uh, today, it's just really quiet. Yeah, I can't wait to see that movie. I know our Dan Hubbard Motor Racing Network had a chance to sit down with both actors. We have the interview on MRN dot com. It's well, easy. Lucky to find. such and such. Yeah, I talked to both of them about just you know for non racing fans, is there enough meat on the bone in this movie? They all felt like there was. He asked about. The fact that, you know, there isn't a ton of CGI when it comes to the racing cars. Now, they used a lot of CGI in recreating some of the vintage tracks and the crowds. Obviously, they didn't have 40 to 50,000 extras. uh, So a lot of that is CGI. But they had to build custom-looking Ford GTs and Ferraris for the movie because those classic cars are worth, like, $20, $30 Twenty thirty million dollars. If you have one in perfect condition, I was actually nobody was going to give that. So. <laughs> I was sitting behind the fellow who owns the actual car that won Le Mans in nineteen sixty six, Mister Rob Kaufman. Yes, uh, who we know is one of the uh, uh, main investors at Chip Ganassi Racing, uh, former driver at Le Mans himself. Uh, yeah, he's got an impressive car collection that we could do an entire show on, but we'll we'll move on from that. All I could say right now is go see it, Tony. Once you see it, we can we can maybe banter a little bit more once the I don't know, the the spoiler grace period has expired a little bit, but it's if you like fast cars, you're going to want to go see this movie. It's it's well done. Yeah, it's on my must-see list. Let's talk a little Formula One because, as you mentioned, this is a packed show. Yeah, let's we get to it. We don't want to run super long. It'll probably be a longer one. We're going to try not to. We're going to try to stay uh, concise. 
couple of things coming out of Formula One right now. Happy birthday, Lando Norris. If you're listening to this on a Wednesday, he's 14 turned now. 20 years old. Oh, okay, okay. Celebrated with one candle on a little bottle of milk next to the car. <laughs> so, Lando, happy birthday at 20 years old. We also know that Alex Albon is signed for next year with Red Bull. Congratulations to him. What a great run. I, he totally earned that. And likewise, his his I, they weren't really teammates. I guess they're kind of like sister mates, if you will. Pierre Gasly. Stable get, mate. Yeah, stable mate getting sent down to Toro Rosso. We weren't sure how that was going to work out. It's worked out great for him. He also gets re-signed for next year. So As has Danny Kafiat. Danny Kafiat. Gets so another lease on every life. Every seat except for the second Williams. <laughs> Latifi. <clears throat> yeah. Le- is Latifi. set. And everybody's saying it's Latifi. He'll get another shot in FP1 at Brazil. Again, I had the dream a long time ago that that was going to happen. So uh, no Nico Hulkenberg. We talked about that last week. We'll be in Formula One. He says he doesn't really want to be a sim driver. He doesn't want to be a backup driver. He doesn't want to be anybody's third wheel, if you will. So it'll be interesting to see where he goes. Eric told us last week he thought DTM, WEC might be good things. We'll talk about that as more develops, but we need to move on and talk about the race this weekend. Sao Paulo, Brazil, Interlagos, always a cool racetrack. Last year had a ton of drama. And it's funny because when you watch the Drive uh, to Survive series on Netflix, I think everybody fell in love with Esteban Ocon. He was this guy that didn't come from a lot of money. He had to really work his way up there. He was kind of the kind of that last of the poor man working Formula One driver whose daddy didn't buy him a ride. People fell in love with that. Then he had a teammate that seemed to run him into the wall a lot. A lot of it was not his fault. He found himself on the outside looking in. He ends up at Mercedes. Everybody's real excited. But the one thing they forget about, and I happen to rewatch that episode was this race in which he came out on fresh tires and decided to race super hard, the leader Max Verstappen, through turn one and into turn two in the downhill and essentially took the leader out. We can place Bane where we want to, but there is always a little bit of fireworks when we get to this race. It wasn't a good look for Ocon, I'll admit that, but... I think it was Lewis Hamilton in the cool down room afterwards was saying to Max, but you were the leader. You had more to lose. Yeah. What's the point in racing him? Why didn't you give him more room? That was the wisdom of a then five time, now six time world champion to the young up and coming phenom of going, you have to know what's at stake when you're racing these guys around you. You, you were the person with the most to lose as the race leader. Yeah. Both people were to blame. You don't race a leader like that when you're already a lap, like, There's no, like, wave around NASCAR rule where suddenly, well, if I get my lap back and we get a safety car, I got a shot to win this thing. No. He was racing for pride. Yeah. You you don't race somebody that hard. But on the other hand, and I think this is where when we talk about the greatest drivers where they have an advantage when you start talking about, yeah, but the great drivers had great cars, but they had to learn how to win. And if you win enough, you learn the difference between – Racing a guy that's obviously decided to push it into turn one, you let him go in turn two, right? You just, it wasn't like Max didn't know in turn one, this guy wasn't going to race the crap out of him. He should have known to just let him go, hit the radio button going, what's this moron doing? Mm -hmm. You know, blown by him down the straightaway with his finger hanging out the out the uh, cockpit and let him know. But uh, instead he had to downgrade from the first place to the second place trophy. Uh, That's a lesson learned for Max Verstappen at a racetrack where he has shown good pace. And uh, I can't remember where he finished in that that rain race a couple years ago where he absolutely slashed through the field and won the hearts and minds of Formula One fans around the world uh, with that crazy wet weather drive. And I haven't checked the weather this week. Uh, I haven't either. Ooh. Here, if you if you want to flap your mouth for a little bit about well, what I you think is going to happen, well, I'll, I'll, I have some yeah, you do that while I look up the weather. I actually looked into some stats. Uh, these are actually courtesy of at Lights Out F One Blog. He's on the uh, Two Soft Compounds podcast. If you listen to that, really good guy. Likes to list the stats. I've been following him lately because I enjoy his his content on that podcast. So these are from him. He posts them in Twitter, so they're free for anybody. I'm not stealing his stuff. Uh, it's his stuff. Five of the last six races in Brazil, <clears throat> excuse me, Brazil, has been won from the pole. 
The other was 2017 when Vettel won from second. So the last six races, the front row is the key. Ferrari, Red Bull, and Mercedes have scored points in all of the last nine seasons at Brazil. The last time Ferrari didn't score at Brazil was 2003. So we tend to see all three of the main people scoring points. Uh, The podium seems to be mixed up as well with all three getting in there. McLaren has been on fire as of late. They've had both their cars make it to Q3 in the last five consecutive races. In fact, if you look at how they, and I need to pull it up real quick. I should have been a little bit quicker to the punch here. If you look at biggest gainers from 2018 to 2019 in qualifying, it's been McLaren who has gained 2.447 positions since last year to this year in qualifying. So McLaren continuing to be that midfield team that is so good, probably the direction I'm going to go with my uh, midfield MVP. Um, But it's going to be interesting. I came into this race, Eric, thinking certainly after what happened at U.S. in which the Ferraris looked so good in practice and then just looked awful, that this would be a Ferrari race, especially thinking – Mercedes has wrapped up the championship. Toto Wolff will not be going to the race. It's the first time since 2013, 14? You are correct. 2013. This is the first turbo hybrid era race that he's missing. He's going to stay back at the shop and work on things that they need to start getting a head start on when it comes to 2020. Also closing up some other things that that just really need his attention that he hasn't been on. That kind of gives me the impression, although Mercedes has said, look, our goal is to win out here that they've kind of moved past this. So that made me think Ferrari again. This is a chance for Ferrari. Which Lo and one, behold, which one though, are you going to take? Well, Charles Leclerc has to take a new motor. Mm. Yep. So that's 10 grid place penalties right off the top. And if they decide to just go ahead and put a new turbocharger and everything else on it and just go completely fresh for the next two races, that's 20 places. He's going to start basically at the back of the grid. So Leclerc's not the guy. So now that leaves, if you're thinking outside of Mercedes, Vettel and Verstappen as the two guys that could possibly win this race. We know Max is really good there. Sebastian, but both of them can make mistakes. So that's where I'm a little bit torn. I think Ferrari has moved on to 2020. I think you're correct, but I do think that some of their – work towards next year is paying dividends on the racetrack that being said i've got the weather okay saturday yes shower or tea storm around 60 percent chance sunday afternoon showers 65 percent i'm picking max for stopping before you can react to my weather report (laughs) that is bs i actually was going to take him if it was dry and now i'm definitely taking i was too all right you can go first on midfield then well, let me give you – man, I, I just hate picking against Lewis. Lewis has nothing to lose now. I mean, he's been well, – I thought he raced pretty chasing careful. Chasing Schumacher's numbers. Yeah. Oh, man. If they do any testing, they got to do it with Botas, right? They got to let Lewis try to win these things out. Vettel, Lewis, Vettel. Lewis. I'm going to go with – I'll go with Lewis to win. That's a strong pick. He won last year. It is. Uh, Courtesy of Esteban Ocon. I'll go. I'll go. Lewis to win, and I'm going to take. I'm going to go. Which McLaren will it be? Lando, the birthday boy. I was thinking McLaren, but now I'm starting to think. Man, I, I think that Danny Ricardo is going to be the quicker. That of the was two who Renault I was drivers. just thinking about in the experience on that track. But sentimentally, I kind of want to see Hulkenberg. And remember, Nico Hulkenberg won a pole position at this track in changing conditions as a rookie in a Williams in 2010. I'm going to go Nico Hulkenberg. I'm going against the grain since I bagged you on Verstappen there. Good stuff. All right. So Max and Nico for Eric, and I'm going to go with Lewis and Lando Norris. Uh, a couple other bits of notes. We won't get into them, to them today because really we wanted this show to just be here's who we like at Brazil. We'll obviously break that race down next week. But we really want to get into this greatest drivers thing because we've had some really good response. There's some good tweets that people have given us their list. I know Eric's done a lot of research. He's got a celebrity picker that we want to mention who knows <laughs> Formula One inside and out. I have my picks. So we'll get into some of these topics later. But the news out of Formula One about by 2025 – they will be 
sustainable in their carbon footprint as it comes to Formula One. But by 2030, they will be carbon free. Interesting. A lot of stuff there. That points we've talked before is Formula E essentially what we're going to see in Formula One. How do you make these engines more efficient as being hybrids? Lots of news going on. There's a lot of talk about the business of the sport, which I don't particularly like. I don't think it's a good look for Formula One right now while they have a lot of momentum. But that's something we can talk about next week. Let's take our break. When we come back, we will get into who we think are the greatest Formula One Grand Prix drivers of all time. It's all that next on American Racing Snobs. Here's your chance to win a set of your very own Hercules tires. Go to HerculesTires.com slash MRN. Simply register, and each month we'll give away one set of tires. Hercules Tires has the value, selection, and industry-leading mileage coverage to get you wherever you need to go, no matter where the road takes you. Register now for your chance to win a set of Hercules tires at HerculesTires.com slash MRN. Hercules Tires, ride on our street. Welcome back to American Racing Snobs. Eric Morris alongside Tony Rizzuti at the Motor Racing Network. And it is time to get your debate gloves on. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about this for a few weeks, asking your opinion. And we really wanted this to just be about the body of work of a Grand Prix driver. There are some drivers who have sustained success in multiple series that included Formula One racing. But we really just wanted to look at what did they accomplish in F1. So, uh, you know, that's to the detriment of someone like Mario Andretti, who was just one of the most versatile drivers of all time, but still a world champion. Uh, I basically considered anyone who had multiple world champions to be eligible for this this final countdown that I made and mm-hmm. started whittling away. Also, I, I there were some single-time champs that I did consider, uh, people like Mario Andretti, people like Nigel Mansell, who only won world, one world championship each. But ultimately, my list ended up being multiple-time world champions. And what I think I'd like to do is, before I actually rank them, what if we had a little bit of a, a debate, first for some readers, and secondly, we could just kind of go down these top candidates alphabetically without spoiling our rankings and kind of debate the merits, the pros, the cons. Why do you think they're so great or or what holds them back from being in that top echelon? Interesting. So you want to start with some tweets from, yeah, let, from the fans? Let's, let's, let's get a couple uh, impressions here. All right. Well, first of all, this one wasn't directly at us, but uh, The Sun, which is a newspaper-ish magazine over in the U.K., Ish. Their motor- Emphasis on the ish. I know. Their their motorsports group picked Lewis Hamilton ahead of Schumacher and Senna. That was their top three. Strong podium. Matt Bishop came in with his top ten Formula One drivers ever. His list is, and I think there's a little bit of cop-out on Matt's behalf. Matt Matt's, uh, it knows his stuff, but he has three at number one, which I, I just don't think you can do that. Yeah. Though I do have a tie at number five, but I'll explain why. He has Clark Fangio and Senna at number one. He has Moss at number four, Stewart at number five, Schumacher six, Hamilton, or excuse me, Heikkinen seven. Heikkinen? Mika Heikkinen? Yes. Wow. Villeneuve eight, Bravo. Well, okay, okay, list I know, over. I know. Door. Bravo. Door. Bravo. Oh, hang on, would you say Gilles Villeneuve? Uh, it doesn't it's got to be it Jacques. Says- it's got to be Gilles. I, I, I immediately thought Jack because I'm just thinking world champion. So he's got two non championship winning drivers in his top seven with sterling moss up there as he's well. got brabham nine and ten being alonzo mm. and hamilton in a tie he says Ascari, pros and vettel don't quite make it others will disagree with my inclusion of brabham and an exclusion of pros especially i think that his inclusion of brabham is pretty heady i think excluding prost is foolhardy all right we have what else you got jaunty beard has clark number one schumacher number two Hamilton, number three, Senna, four, Fangio, five, Jackie Stewart, six, Nikki Lauda, seven, uh, Alain Prost at number eight, Bravum at nine, and Heikkinen again at ten. Heikkinen. Okay. And then finally, um, I don't have the full, the way I chopped this screenshot, I just have what he goes by. I don't have his actual handle, but Lando season, four is his uh, little handle. It looks like at Hearn for Norris, maybe, is his name. His 10 greatest F1 drivers ever. Schumacher 1, Hamilton 2, Senna 3, Fangio 4, Prost 5, Vettel 6, Alonso 7, 
Clark 8, Loudon 9, Brabham 10. Hey, so we got a lot of the same names kind of banging around here. Those were those were the three people. Let me check the Twitter real quick, see if anybody else maybe responded. But those are the three. Those are the three that that responded. Uh, so the guys who who just fell short of my top ten for debate purposes, I want to give honorable mentions to. I like honorable mentions. Yeah, honorable mentions didn't quite make the cut to this debate. Alberto Ascari. 13 wins in 33 starts, double world champion. Tragically, his his career and life were cut short at Monza. That's why the corner leading up to the corner where he was killed is now the Ascari Variante. Uh, his highlight was he won six out of eight races in 1952. That's pretty strong. Uh, I also considered three-time champion Sir Jack Brabham from Australia and also three-time world champion Nelson Piquet from Brazil. Didn't quite make my top ten. Uh, but uh, the guys that I did want to kind of go through, and this is just an alphabetical order, so we can kind of debate the pros and cons. Uh, Fernando Alonso, Jimmy Clark, Juan Manuel Fangio, Lewis Hamilton, Nicky Lauda, Elaine Prost, Michael Schumacher, Ayrton Senna, Sir Jackie Stewart, and Sebastian Vettel are the 10 that I've kind of got on my radar to debate. Do you have any qualms? additions or subtractions you want to make? I do have an addition to your list. Okay, let me add them at the bottom. Uh, but I'm not going to add it because it's part of my tie, and it's the reason okay. I have a tie, so I'm going to save we'll it. save that. It's my little nugget, but I do want to tell you why I find this so difficult. And I'm going to give you kind of a non-racing analogy as to why this is so hard. We're talking for metaphors. We're, we're talking about drivers that span across completely different eras. We're talking about guys that that had one car, maybe one engineer, or maybe the driver even worked on the car. They ran all sorts of different. They weren't specialized. They ran all different things. There, there are guys when you start talking about the Jimmy Clarks of the world that were just naturally talented in anything they got in with reckless abandon whose careers were cut short. And then you've got the modern age guys that have simulation and computers and massive amounts of money and training and all the different things that go into it to compare the two is quite unfair. And here's my analogy. And we're going to try it anyway. <laughs> and here's my analogy kind of going away from racing is why I say this is difficult. There is a quarterback that is in the NFL Hall of Fame. His name is Fran Tarkington. Fran Tarkington was the longtime quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. Fran Tarkington retired in 1986, and when he retired, he held every major quarterback statistical leadership category there was. If you went to a quarterback category, he was number one. He owned them all, including most passing yards, which to this day is still one of the biggest. He was a first ballot Hall of Famer. This guy was his lock for the NFL Hall of Fame as could be. He was a nine-time Pro Bowler. He won the MVP in 1975, but Eric, he never won a Super Bowl. He never won a championship, but he was still first ballot Hall of Famer, as good as you could get, led every category. If you look at those same categories now, not only is he not number one, in the majority of him, he isn't even listed. He doesn't even exist on those. The passing yards, which was the big push for him to get into the Hall of Fame without a championship, he's 12th now. The point being is, if you took his same statistics and compared them to the players today, not only would he not be a first ballot Hall of Famer, you could argue that he may not even be good enough to be in the Hall of Fame with the modern-day players. Now, this is a guy that when they rank the NFL 100 greatest players, not quarterbacks, 100 greatest players, he was number 59. And when you look at all his statistics and the fact that he didn't win a championship, he probably would not be a Hall of Famer in 2020 class. That's what makes this so hard. Obviously, at the time of his retirement, he was by far, if you're a first ballot, you're damn near unanimous. Everybody said this guy's a lock. You move, what, 20, oh, the game changes. 23, 33 years later, and now he's likely doesn't have the stats to get in. 
That's what makes this so hard. Yeah. And we're That's what makes to this adjust. subjective. Yeah, it's subjective. We're going to attempt to filter through all this and try to compare. And it's hard because it's emotional, too, because you have emotional attachments to memories and and the legends of some of these guys who you may not have seen in person, but you know all about them because you've seen the newsreels or drivers who died young. You kind of look at them through rose-colored glasses yes. sometimes. Think about Dale Earnhardt and NASCAR. Uh, St. Dale. He was no saint, and he used to get booed more than any other driver in his lifetime, and everything kind of changes when you look at them in the rearview mirror. So we're going to attempt to account for these things and mostly just have a, a fun argument about it. Eric, this. my biggest pet peeve in racing is when a younger driver fails to either win a race or win a championship, and somebody's like, oh, he's got so much talent, he's so young, he's going to eventually, it's not going to be a matter of if he gets one, it's how many he's going to get. You don't know that. Racing's a dangerous sport. There's bullfighting and auto racing, and everything else is just a hobby. Mountain climbing. Did I forget mountain yeah, climbing? Yeah, mountain climbing. The point er, is, er, there's, no, Ernest Hemingway over there's no guarantee if somebody loses a race that they're suddenly yeah. going to win one or a championship. I would have thought at some point in time there'd be plenty of guys that would have won a championship that didn't. So I, I, I'm with you on that. The idea that somebody's life was cut short, that they'd have gone on to shatter all these, we don't know that. But it, but it's good for the debate. Yeah. Length of career certainly matters and opportunity also. So let's start the debate with in. Fernando I, Alonso. Now, I only have five. Okay. I only have five. I thought about Alonso. I, I thought about him as well, and... I think the high water mark for him was when he was in his mid twenties. He knocked off Michael Schumacher in consecutive years when he was at the height of his Ferrari dominance. Um, and also, there is no sign that Fernando Alonso's skills ever diminished in a Formula One car. I think he was every bit as quick when he retired at the end of last year as he was when he was winning those World Championships in '05 and '06. See, that one's hard for me to complete. I do agree with you. Because I think that's the case. But it's hard for me to completely 100% agree with you because he made it very well known how bad the McLaren Honda was, right? But Sitting out in a chair destroyed after destroyed every teammate he had with the exception of Lewis Hamilton. He thrashed them. I, and I, that's a big part of Formula One is I, beating I, your Again, teammate. I don't disagree with you, but but to say he still had those same skills driving that McLaren – I don't know that. I think he probably did because he went on, what did he, podium? I'm not steal your Morse code later, but didn't he podium into cars? Yeah. So Crazy. 32 Grand Prix wins. He's got to be in the discussion. Where does he fall? Let's see in a little bit. The next name I want to talk about. Yes. Big one. Jimmy Clark. Yes. Jimmy Clark was on almost everybody's list. Everybody's. Uh, in the top. He was on everybody's list and in the top five of all but one. And I was think, rolling my eyes thinking, what is that guy thinking? Now, this is one of those drivers where it's kind of hard to look at objectively because he died in his prime in that Correct. crash in Formula 2 at Hockenheim in 1968. This is another driver who I think is hurt by our parameters of Grand Prix resume only because Jimmy Clark won an Indy 500. Yep. He won Formula I think he won 3 world titles in the same year in 65. Uh, absolutely dominant driver. He won 34% of the races he ever started in F1. He was on the pole for 45% of them. In 1963 his first championship, he won 7 out of 10 Grand Prix. Yep. And the stat that's mind-blowing to me Eight Grand Slams. That means on pole, led every lap, won the race, fastest lap. Yep. No one else has more than five. Correct. And Jimmy Clark does not have as many starts. That's another thing that's really hard to compare is that the modern drivers have such a bigger sample size to choose from of how many starts, and therefore their numbers are huge. So we're trying to even that out as we look at someone like Jimmy Clark. Clark's going to be one of those guys that the people listening probably have – in the top three, and I wouldn't be surprised if a small minority of them have him number one. He's just one of those guys, we'll talk about Senna as well, that people just have a, most people didn't see him race. All we know are the stories, but the stories are huge. Fangio, who should be in somebody's top ten, I have him in my top five, I'll tell you where. Fangio called him the greatest ever. 
That's a high compliment. Fangio now, won four championships. He was the five championships. Five, he was the original Formula One winner right off He's the bat. He's the godfather. He's the guy. He started it all. He was the first superstar. He called Clark the greatest ever. The thing that really speaks to me was, as you mentioned, the compliments from his peers. Sir Jackie Stewart said, when we came onto the scene together in the 60s, we were like Batman and Robin, and there was no doubt about which one of us was Batman. It was Jimmy Clark. Um, uh, our our guest contributor uh, was, I believe, the coordinating producer at Speed Channel and Fox Sports back when F1 was on Speed and Fox, uh, Mr. Frank Wilson. Frank Wilson, yep. Uh, friend of the show, really great guy, and his F1 IQ is through the roof. And he pointed out something to me about Jimmy Clark that I never noticed. You know how many times Jimmy Clark finished second in his F1 career? Mm-mm. One time. Hmm. You know what that says to me? Either he won the race or the car was broken. Because we're in a – think about those conversations we had with David Hobbs about how unreliable race cars were back then and how many coulda, woulda, shouldas. This is a guy who put up enormous numbers despite driving – what is one of the most fragile F1 cars of all time, the, the Lotus 25 through 49 uh, of the mid-60s? Fast car. Ridiculously but, overpowered. It, not it, balanced. But it was known to be fragile. Yeah. What, what was Colin Chapman's uh, mantra? I think it was simplify and add lightness. This car was known to be unreliable, and he still put up huge numbers. And that one second-place finish means that if he was on the road, he was the guy to beat. And you weren't going to beat him. He was a, he's, I don't use this often. He was a driver without a peer. There was no one out there who could match his speed in his era. Yeah, every time he strapped into that car, he was riding the lightning, literally. I think, you know, we could talk about Jimmy Clark all day. I know I can. And if you, you want to learn more about Jimmy Clark, I, I should look up what season it was. But I think it was either season two or season three of uh, uh, The Grand Tour. You know, that show mm-hmm. with uh, Hammond, Clarkson, and May from Top Gear, their, their new Amazon Prime show. They did a 10-minute essay on Jimmy Clark that is just fantastic. Uh, if you want more info on him, go, go watch that. We're going to move down our list alphabetically to another heavy hitter, and that is Juan Manuel Fangio of Argentina. Yep. As we mentioned, the godfather. He won 46% of the races he yep. ever entered. 24 victories from only 52 starts. His poll percentage, number one all time, 55%. Of the races he was in, he was the quickest guy in qualifying. And here's what blows my mind about Juan Manuel Fangio. All of this happened when he was in his 40s. It's Be- unbelievable. Because the first Grand Prix season of 1950, I think he was 39 years old and turned 40 that year. His final win in 1957, he was 46 years old. And just a, a quick word about that race. Because if I had a time machine, this would be the race I would go to. The 1957 German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. I think it is the single-handed greatest drive in Formula One history. Juan Manuel Fangio, in his Maserati, planned a one-stopper. And that was kind of unheard of. Most people went the entire race back then because there were no regs about tire compounds or anything like Mm -hmm. that. And they didn't have pit crews, really. Just a couple mechanics. So it took a long time to change tires. He planned a one-stopper in a 22-lap race with 10 laps to go. And in the next 10 laps, he broke the Nürburgring track record nine times. And he overhauled Mike Hawthorne on the final lap when he was 46 years old. This is a driver that put up big numbers, plus he has, he's, he's got the, I did this, and just imagine what I could have done if this had existed, you know, if the... You can say all these ifs and or, or buts about World War II and how it affected Grand Prix racing in Europe and the world. But Juan Manuel Fangio, his body of work is massive, mm-hmm. and it still has that question mark of what could he have done if he had raced more in his 30s. He's in my top five. You got anything you want to add about Juan Manuel? Because mm-hmm. I have one other thing. No, I, I got into it earlier. Just, you know, he was okay. that original godfather. Um you know the twenty four wins, the five championships, the four. I actually wrote down forty six percent win percentage. That that's crazy. It's, to win forty six percent of your races is nuts. Here is the other thing about Juan. You talk about Schumacher and Ferrari, Hamilton and Mercedes, Clark and Lotus, Senna and McLaren, all dominant car and driver combinations. Juan Manuel Fangio won 
races and championships for Alfa Romeo, Maserati, Mercedes-Benz, and Ferrari. Different time. He would jump around. I agree. And he could win in anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's my case four. Or did he jump to the best car every time? It's hard to say. He, he must be the best at hopscotch I've ever seen. It's He's the opposite of Alonzo. Yeah. We, we didn't mention that in Alonzo. <laughs> His career was kind of plagued by just poor career choices, mm-hmm. going, leaving M- McLaren when he shouldn't have, joining Ferrari when they were on a downswing, MFing Honda and screwing up his own IndyCar future, just things like that. Fangio seemed to have that golden touch. Uh, going down the list, that brings us to Lewis Hamilton. Yes. What do you say about Lewis Hamilton that we haven't already said? He's the current era goat. Uh, hands down. Hands down the best of his generation. Uh, his win percentage right now is at 33%, fourth all time. Remember, he had four wins as a rookie and should have won the championship if he hadn't made a couple slight errors and also was getting torpedoed by his teammate, Fernando, at McLaren. Uh, other things I want to mention about Lewis Hamilton, 13 consecutive seasons with the win, and some of those cars had no business whatsoever. Some of those later McLarens he was in and that first Mercedes that he drove uh, was not by any stretch of the imagination a championship-winning car. And I think that he has elevated that team to win some of these championships where Ferrari might have had the upper hand with a different driver Mercedes doesn't win all of those championships. Yeah, he's a guy that when everybody wants to argue, but it's been all the car, I will argue that all day and night long that it's him. The car certainly has helped. They've had the best car, right? But Mostly. Lu- Lewis is incredible. He's just incredible. Think about this. What he's shown this year in taking tires beyond what Pirelli says they can even do and not just get them home – but on the last lap, turn the fastest lap of the race on tires that aren't even supposed to go that long? That's it, insane. It's just another layer on top of a driver whose reputation was blindingly fast in qualifying and also a demon of an overtaker, the last of the late breakers. But think about this. How clean is Lewis Hamilton? Have you ever? Can you name a mistake or a collision that you thought he screwed up in? For how many races he's been in. Germany this year, maybe, but everybody kind of made a mistake. Yeah, a a torrential downpour, things like that are going to happen. The race winner spun, so I'm not going to really ding him for that. Uh, You could look back to that collision with him and Nico Rosberg at Catalonia in 2016 on the opening lap. I put that at 80% Rosberg. I do, too. Who slammed him off the track and collided there. But he is so clean and aggressive. I don't think I've ever seen a driver that was both. To, to the level that he is. So high marks for Lewis Hamilton. He's definitely going to be towards the top of some of these lists. And yes. he was really the reason why we started this conversation. Is it was. Where does he sit yep. right now? Uh, moving down the list alphabetically, Nicky Lauda. What a legend. Uh, obviously, we lost him earlier this year, and that was a, a sad moment. A triple world champion. And I think a lot of the aura around Nicky comes from that crash at the Nürburgring in 1976. Uh, It was the topic of the movie Rush and the guts that it took to come back, even though he fell, what was it, one point short of James Hunt's championship. It would have been three in a row if he had closed that deal. Uh, But I don't think that diminishes his legend or his reputation at all. I agree. Guttiest driver that's ever been out there, probably the bravest driver that's ever been out there. Not a foolish driver. A guy that could work on his own car, knew how to build the cars, knew how to make them better. Kind of that real true engineering cerebral kind of background. Is how yeah, him. a very and and not a guy that had a whole lot of friends. A, a guy that was very misunderstood, so he had to do it alone. And look, everybody knows that if you want to be the if you want everybody to know that you're the best and the smartest guy in the room, and you're going to make it a point to remind them. You're not going to have many friends, and if you go it alone, that's tough. That's a, To put all that pressure on yourself all the time, not have people particularly like you, not have people want to talk to you, to be able to, to kind of keep all that inside and still have that, that, that inner fortitude to be the best at what you're doing, that was Nicky Lauda, just mentally tough, smart guy, gutty guy. Incredible. Incredible. Triple world champion, two for Ferrari, one in his comeback for McLaren in 1984. 
See where he sorts out going down alphabetically. The next driver to discuss, Elaine Prost. Here's a guy, Eric, that I think is going to get lost on a lot of these lists or probably further down the list than he should be. Correct me if I'm wrong, four world championships? Four-time world champion, three that's, with McLaren, one with Williams. That's a lot. Um, it's more than almost anybody. Only uh, Fangio, Schumacher, and Hamilton have more. You fall into another little mini era within there in which it was, what, Manzel and Prost just going at it every week. I and think don't forget Nelson Piquet was in there, all too. All those guys world were champion. in there, but I, I just think because of some of the other numbers— because of some of the bigger personalities, because of some of the romance we have with some of the older drivers, I think Prost is going to be one of those guys who's going to get under-delivered in our list. And, and I don't know that it's fair. He also wasn't a—he he's not a flashy guy. When we still see him with the Renault team, it's like you just kind of get this meh. Like, like Kimmy's meh, but he's funny, smart-ass, sarcastic Dry. meh. So Prost just meh. The thing to me about he's Prost, hard to love. He was painted as an antagonist in the Senna film, which was very popular, and he was the chief rival of Ayrton Senna. Yeah. So if Senna's the good guy in the the theater of your memory, then Prost is the villain, and I don't think that's entirely fair. It's not entirely one sided. Now he is is he completely innocent? Absolutely not. I thought the way that Elaine raced Ayrton at Suzuka in 1988 was unconscionable. Uh, when he crashed into him going into that chicane and then filed the protest that he didn't complete the lap by going through the runoff road. That's absolute crap. But that shouldn't diminish Elaine's resume. Mm -hmm. You have to remember he was going up against, I think, the fiercest competition in F1 history and won four world championships yep. while doing it. And uh, this is another point that Frank Wilson made to me. Those guys, Prost, Senna, Mansell, P.K., I think that even though they didn't have, first of all, their numbers aren't as bloated as, say, a, a Schumacher or a Hamilton because there weren't as many races in those seasons. They were running like 12, 13, 14 races a year. Uh, so it's not possible to put up those huge numbers. But he thinks, and I, I tend to agree with him, that a win might mean more in a championship might mean more in the mid to late 80s and early 90s because of the competition, because of who you had to beat, and because, with the exception of the 1988 McLaren, the MP44, which is an utterly dominant car, there was a real strong competition at the front of those fields. Yeah, I think that's a good argument. And, and, and again, that's it's hard to argue that that was better competition than what we have now. It's hard to argue that that championship meant more than any of Fangio's championships, any of Schumacher's, or the one Hamilton just won. Really, that becomes a personal preference and a big debatable topic mm -hmm. that I don't think there's there's no way to prove. There's, there's no, no right winner. answer. There's there no right be. answer. But but I can agree with that. I think, uh, or I can at least, I don't know that I agree with that uh, for that very reason. I don't I don't think any championship is worth more than any other. But I will agree that that was one of the peak peak competition uh, top eras of formula one and that winning there took something it took something and he was able to do it but again he's the I, professor i think he's going to be underserved he is not in my top five he was not the quickest when it came down to him and senna but he was able to beat him to a championship and beat him regularly in races because he was a thinking driver he knew exactly what had to happen to be successful. I think he's one of those guys that when you start talking it all the way through, people would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I should probably yeah. move him up, but then who are you going to move down? Yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard. Uh, moving down alphabetically, another big one, Michael Schumacher. Now, the numbers obviously speak for themselves. They're ridiculous. They're, they're absolutely swollen. That five-year stretch. They look from, like numbers nobody could touch, and somebody might. Which is crazy. Yes. Uh, he's in front for now for wins and titles. Uh, his record, 15 straight seasons with the win. It is a bit lucky, I should mention, that uh, he probably shouldn't have won in 2005. His only victory that year was the much maligned United States Grand Prix where only six cars took place. Mm -hmm. But he still wanted to keep that streak going. It was the same going. for everybody. Um, 
another impressive stat, 77 fastest laps. I don't think anyone's going to get to that number, especially now that there's a, a point on offer for it. It kind of opens that fight up to the midfielders. Um, I think there's so many good things you can say about what Michael Schumacher accomplished, especially in that Ferrari run. Uh, I do want to acknowledge a black mark on his resume is that he was absolutely ruthless. When we were talking about Lewis Hamilton. Are you going to say the same thing when we get to Senna? I am. Okay. Uh, Michael Schumacher had intentional incidents with definitely Jacques Villeneuve to the point where they threw him out of the 1997 season and disqualified him because they were sick of Michael driving into the side of people with the championship on the line because it wasn't the first time. Right. 1994 collided with Damon Hill in Australia. Now, Michael, obviously supremely talented, but he, I'm taking into account when comparing him to someone like Hamilton who was clean and does these overtakes and can be trusted to race alongside people without crashing into them, even with the entire championship on the line. I'm thinking of how he raced Nico Rosberg as clean as could be imagined in 2016. I don't think we saw that same thing from Michael Schumacher. And I don't want to be super down on him because obviously he's one of the greats. But I did take that into consideration. I know that may not be a popular opinion. 15 consecutive seasons with a win, 91 wins. He won 13 in 2004, a 72% winning percentage in that year. Seven titles. It's no secret here because I put the T's out when I asked people to respond and give us their greatest ever list. My number one greatest of all time is Michael Schumacher. He is not my number one. But it's what makes this fun. Yeah. Did he sure win is. like five championships in a row at one he time? He did. That's he did. Nuts. That Ferrari was That's nuts. And only a few of them were close. Now I don't know what that says about Rubens Barrichello. That's a lot of winning, Eric. It sure is. You can't argue with it. But is he is he the GOAT? He's my goat. You, of course, my goat, you can't be a goat unless you wore red. So Yeah. yeah. You, you, I, is, I, I do have some. I don't even know if they're rose-colored glasses. Yeah. I think they're a darker they're, shade. They're they're Marinello red. Yes, they are. Uh, moving down the list to another heavy hitter, Ayrton Senna. I already mentioned that I am considering driving standards uh, in ranking this. So it is certainly a black mark on Senna that he had more contact on track than pretty much anyone else on this list. Uh, he was a very aggressive driver, but the passion that he inspires, the record that he could put on at Monaco, Formula One's most difficult track, he was absolutely sublime. Six-time Monaco Grand Prix winner. It could have been more. He should have won two more, if you think about it. Uh, the first year that he drove for McLaren, he... he Selfishly was trying to embarrass Elaine Prost on pace, had a 50-second lead and tossed into the barriers with just a few laps to go. Otherwise, he would have won, uh, what is that, seven straight consecutive? And he nearly won in 84 in the pouring rain in a Tolman before they stopped the race. So there's no Tolman. A Tolman. (laughs) Finished second to Prost when they had to stop the race. If the race had continued, he surely would have passed him. But... Formula One is not just Monaco, and it's not just who is the fastest driver in a single lap, because in terms of raw pace and talent, I don't know that you're ever going to surpass Senna. You might match him with a couple of the guys on this list, Uh, but he's a driver who evokes a lot of passion, and I do think that he might be the quickest human who ever lived, but it's hard to judge for a lot of reasons, because anyone who's killed in their prime, it tends to leave their legacy a little bit mythical. He's. Mm-hmm. Are, are we judging the myth of Ayrton Senna or the man? Both. I I think, I don't want to speak for all Formula One people because somebody will tweet us and tell us we're wrong. But the people that I've spoken to within all forms of racing that, that follow Formula One, whether they're a media person or a driver, that know some of the history of it, two names come up as the best physical drivers of a race car ever. And those two names that always come back to me are Ayrton Senna and Jimmy Clark, that they were the two greatest get in a race car, doesn't matter what kind of race car, and go natural talent race car drivers. I think it's unfair 
to not put Lewis Hamilton in that same category because I believe Lewis Hamilton has the greatest hand-eye coordination, quick twitch motions of a race car driver that has ever been. He just has insanely good hands and eyes, and obviously the feet go with it. The whole package works as one. So I can see that with Senna. I will be very honest here, Eric. Had it not been for cocktails and beers with David Hobbs in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, I would have Senna near the top of my list, if not the top of my list. But in talking to a guy who sat behind one of those dangerous race cars and spent time as a media member and a voice of Formula One and knows these people in inside and out, his feelings on Ayrton Senna made me change my mind and move him down my list. Hobbs's feeling of the guy was dangerous. He believed only God was there to protect him and nothing would happen. And that probably led to a lot of the things he was able to accomplish on the racetrack from sheer intimidation because other guys didn't want to die. There were a lot of older drivers that had been through that period where we did, you know, ambulance out drivers on a regular basis who did not return to the racetrack. The fact that he scared a lot of people with his recklessness brought it down a little bit. We talked about that earlier, kind of the, the black mark on everybody's thing. I think Senna had the natural talent. We'll never know going forward. But but that took him from maybe my top spot where I think a lot of people may have him. I think that's fair. And I, I think the specific example was before Senna's RG Bargies with Prost uh, when David was working, I think, the ABC feed. Uh, might have been back in Senna's Lotus days where he was leading a race and uh, somebody went to pass him. And he just ran him all the way down towards the pit wall. And they had to either back out or crash into the pits. And that doesn't show a very high regard for the well-being of your fellow racers and that's just one example but it is something that i am taking into consideration uh he is clearly one of the all-time greats but that's something that i am considering just like i did with michael schumacher uh two drivers left to talk about real quickly sir jackie three-time world champion once with matra twice with tyrrell uh really the face of the sport from the the late 60s early 70s especially And really, the contribution goes beyond the steering wheel in Formula One with the safety advances as well. 100%. This is a guy who is number five on my list in a tie with Fangio. So I'm giving you my number five right now. I think Fangio's the five, but I think Jackie Stewart's in there more for what he did for auto racing, standing up when nobody else wanted to and saying, this isn't going to cut it. These racetracks aren't going to cut it. The safety people around the racetrack aren't going to cut it. These cars aren't going to cut it. As drivers, we got to look out for each other. We need to we need to organize and make sure that that we we'll, we can bring the sport to the fans. This is just ridiculous. And he took a lot of crap for it, right? Auto racing was this brave macho thing, and that's just the way it. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Also won three championship. Also won twenty seven times. Jackie Stewart, what he did for the sport of Formula One and how we enjoy it and how we talk about these other modern race car drivers, I don't know that any of that would have ever happened if it hadn't been for Jackie Stewart standing up for the sport of auto racing. Well said. I'm going to leave it at that. Sebastian Vettel. Mm. This is a tough one. Mm. Because if you look at him in just his body of work at Red Bull, good God. Four straight championships. Insane. I think he won nine straight races to close out the 2013 season, uh, his fourth straight championship. In 2011, he set the record for the most poles in a season with 15. Uh, He's third all-time in laps led behind only Schumacher and Hamilton. But we've seen him kind of come unglued. This Ferrari fairy tale has been a bit of a nightmare lately, and that's certainly going to count against him. You, the, the word you had there was perfect. But. But. I mean, this was a guy, this was the guy we thought could catch Schumacher. This was the guy that when he won his fourth, we're like, well, these records could be in trouble. And like, then, this kid's young, and he's just on it. But he went to the most popular Formula One team. But first... 
he got his ass handed to him by Danny Rick. He did. In 2014. That broke him. You've Sebast- said that many Sebastian times. Sebastian didn't lead a lap. He won four straight championships, won nine straight races, nearly beat Alberto Ascari's record for n- number of consecutive laps in the lead to finish 2013. And then Ricardo comes in, promoted from Toro Rosso, wins three races, and Sebastian's nowhere, didn't lead a single lap, and goes off to Ferrari, and it is not... C- He's got to win a championship at Ferrari to stay in this conversation. You have said many times on this program that you think Ricardo broke him, mentally broke him. From that point on, we started to see a Sebastian Vettel who rarely made mistakes, make mistakes, and look average at times behind the wheel of a car. Over the last three years at Ferrari, Vettel has looked average, midfield talent average, the weird spins, and maybe that was all the car. Maybe they were odd setups to try to get more speed out of it because they've been that far behind Mercedes in the turbo hybrid era. Whatever it was, he just makes – he does things that, at times, Eric, that I only went to five. I can't put him in my top five. I don't know that I could put him in the top ten. I didn't go that low. Maybe I put him at ten. I had him at ten. But 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 – yeah, he's but the that butt. Red Bull stuff was, it was so the amazing, and then you were so but. great. But yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, and I think I think I think the majority of people listening right now are going to agree with this. They're going to go, yeah, but still in his prime and really good equipment, he's looked average. Mm-hmm. And Leclerc and Leclerc is, has is outdriven him this his, year. Yeah, and Leclerc is certainly far, nipping at his heels by far. A kid with one year of Formula One experience. Mm-hmm. All right. So, this brings us down to the rankings. Yep. You want to go first, Tony? What's I will your, go first. What's your top five? We know you got a tie for fifth with Sir Jackie and Juan Manuel. Sir Jackie and Fangio, and we know why. Number four for me is Senna. I would have had Senna much higher before talking to David Hobbs. I love Hobbo, and I'm not going to pretend that Hobbo is the go-to guy that knows everything about Formula One, but this is a guy that drove the cars has never left being involved in the sport, knows the majority of the people personally, has been in other forms of racing from a media standpoint. So he's got a good vision on what the sport is. And Hobbo's also not a guy that says completely off-the-wall stuff that you're like, what? This guy's crazy. He stays pretty much within the box of racing. So he brought me down with Senna, but I will, again, I did not, see center race in his prime i was too young really to understand all that then i wasn't i just we just didn't see it i personally but again when i talk to people including hubbo as far as pure driving talent the ability to get the car to do what you're wanting it to do he's one of the greatest ever i have him number three and you know what uh bob barsha oh, once me, said I have about him number him? four bob barsha once said of Ayrton senna he was an imperfect man who may have been the perfect racer, mm-hmm. and I think that's the best description I've heard of Senna. Number three on my list is Jimmy Clark. Again, another guy I didn't see, so going off a lot about what I read, what I hear, people I respect. For Fangio to call him the greatest ever is, to me, one of the greatest compliments that any driver could ever get. I mean, one of the greatest ever saying, Haha, no, I, I was good. This guy's the greatest ever, as you mentioned it. A car that was just evil. It was super fast, but it was evil. It wasn't an overly perfectly balanced car. Like you had to, if you were going to drive that car to its limit, there was a limit. And he went over that limit quite a bit. He just, in everybody's mind, was a great guy, a great competitor, could get anything out of a car, could win another series. And I know we said we weren't going to take that into account. But pure natural driving ability in most people's books, either one or two in natural talent. Again, his life cut short, but in the time he was there, two championships, the 25 wins, the incredible, what, seven out of ten one one year. I mean, just his stats were great. I have him number three on my list. So I think I know who your number two is going to be. You do be. know who my number two is. That would be Car 44. It would be Car 44. I think Lewis Hamilton is a once-in-a-generation, once-in-a-lifetime driver. He has incredible hand-eye coordination. He has incredible car control. He has the ability to go fast and not wear out his stuff. He has the ability to complain 
look complete or sound completely defeated behind the wheel of a car and still manage to make it do what it needs to do. You mentioned that he could have already probably broken Schumacher's record in a lot of cases. He didn't always have the fastest car. He had a teammate, Nico Rosberg, that did not was not a good teammate to him. There are people that still can't stand Nico Rosberg for the way he treated Lewis Hamilton, and you don't hear that about Lewis Hamilton. For all the things of what Botas has had to do over the last two years to kind of be the doma stay to Lewis, it hadn't been Lewis complaining about him. It's been somebody else coming on the thing. Hey, it's James. You need to slow down. You need to make sure. It's not Lewis, but you'll still hear Vettel complain about Leclerc. You'll hear Leclerc complain about Vettel. You'll hear other drivers complain about their teammates. Hamilton did a little bit that with Rosberg because Rosberg had taken the gloves off and it and made it really not fair. But I think Lewis Hamilton, I think he ties Schumacher's record. I don't know if he beats it. For whatever reason, there are records for titles that somehow they get there and they get stuck, and especially when it's seven. Like Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson and Richard Petty. It just suddenly something happens to where you can't pass that guy. I think Hamilton is incredible. I think if you put Hamilton in these older cars, personal preference, personal thought, just because of his the way he rose go-karts and the way they figured out he should race go-karts was he raced radio-controlled cars against older people that were really good at it as a little kid, and he whipped their ass. He was a world champion in RC cars, which is all hand-eye coordination, staring at your car, turning little wheels and knobs. They put him in a go-kart. They didn't have the best stuff. They didn't have a lot of money. They looked like fools when they showed up at the racetrack. And he beat everybody with good equipment because he has incredible car control, and it does what it does. Lewis Hamilton is incredible. And we haven't even mentioned the fact that, guess what? He doesn't look like everybody else either. He's had to bear that burden. In a snobby Formula One. And you know what? He doesn't shy away from it, but he doesn't use it as his calling card either. He doesn't look at, whoa, look at what I've had to put up with. Look, And you know he has. You know he has. You remember the... uh the Alonzo fans coming to the, the Spanish Grand Prix or to the preseason tests in blackface, all that crazy stuff. This man he just brushes it off and takes it in stride. He's done everything, and he's done it off the, the racetrack to bring attention to Formula One with his fashion and his music. I know a lot of people don't like that, but guess what? It brings a lot of other people in, especially young people. Well, he's not a super young guy. He's not a Lando Norris or a Charles Leclerc. Young people still like Lewis Hamilton. Fans like Lewis Hamilton. I'm a Ferrari guy. I can't stand Mercedes. Guess what? I like Lewis Hamilton. I think he's a good dude. I have incredible respect for him. He's number two on my list only because I think what Schumacher did at the time he did it, everybody said, this is untouchable. Turns out it may not be. But at the time, he was untouchable. He was incredible. He became this larger-than-life legend, and he did it in the red car, the only car that's been there from the beginning. Well, he brought him back from the depths, too. Certainly if you remember, it did. was it was a dry spell in the early 90s for Ferrari, and when he went there, it wasn't a sure thing, but he built that team around him with Ross Braun and all the people that made Ferrari into uh, Jean Tote, another yep. one of those guys in the brain. Every trust time man. I see him in pictures, I keep forgetting because he's now with with Formula One in the FIA, or excuse me, with the FIA. So every time I see him, it's just so odd because I'm like, aren't you that guy that sits <laughs> up on the podium with him, the little guy? <laughs> yeah, Schumacher's my goat. I what? would say, though, what the would it take for at- you to put Hamilton above Schumacher? What does Lewis have eight. to do? Eight. Simple. Eight. Eight. I, you okay. can't take a guy that's won two or three championships and put him ahead of a guy that's won seven. That, that to me, that jump, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? We talked about that <laughs> with Fran Tarkenton. But to take a guy like Senna, who has three, and put him number one over a guy that has 91 wins and seven championships, to me is just too subjective. It's to me, the wins can be, subjective. you can explain away the wins because of how many races there were when Lewis and Michael had been Still racing. Still had to win them. He did. But when you've got that car that wins 17 out of 19 races, and Jimmy Clark only had eight races to choose from, 
that's where the wins can be misleading. The win percentage to me can be more interesting, and that was a big part of my picks. So. All right. Uh, we probably don't have – fly through your yeah, bottom yeah. Well, five. We've, we've already argued through yeah, most of this. Yeah, we're at an hour so we, four. Yeah, so we'll, we'll wrap this up real quick. I don't want to keep – say what you need to say, but yeah. just get through maybe 10 through 6 I, I mentioned quicker. Vettel was my 10th. Yep. Then I had Alonzo in 9th. I'm not sure if that pick's going to age well. Um, then I had Sir Jackie, P8. Probably should be higher because of his safety I don't know. Like I said, I have him at a tie with Fangio. Yeah. I kind of threw him in there just because of that, but – it's hard to say there. Nikki Lauda, seventh on my list. Nice. Elaine Prost, P6. I think that's fair for him. I think that's about where he belongs. I do. I think that's pretty strong. I think that's where our friend Frank Wilson had him as well. I'll, go, I'll, I'll list his picks as well because I, I, I just had a crazy idea. Yeah, I'll I'm get curious. Back to that. I'm curious. I had Michael, P5. Mm. Explain. Uh, he's so fast. He's so quick. But he was so ruthless. Uh, needlessly ruthless, I thought. With the racing way... is a selfish sport. It is, but I think that three of the four guys in front of him managed to do it without putting other people in danger. Okay. Um, which is why I had Ayrton Senna in fourth. I had Senna and Schumacher in my mind. They were tied for third for a very long time, but I have only recently moved Lewis Hamilton ahead of both. Ayrton Senna, and Michael Schumacher, in my mind. Um, obviously, this is all opinion. Sure. But I put Lewis at P3. Is he your highest of the modern era? By Yes. Or yes, what I'm, What yeah. I think most people are going to think of the modern era? Of the modern drivers, yes. Right. And this last one was really tough for me. Was that hard for you to only have him that high? Because you're such a big fan. I am such a big fan, and I'm trying to be objective. Um, I think if he continues to broaden his skill set this this tire management thing he's been doing this year is incredible if he gets eight does it change where you put him i i think maybe right now i've got jimmy clark in second okay jimmy clark was absolutely without a peer he if his car didn't fail he couldn't be beaten which means it took some reliability failures for nico rosberg to beat lewis hamilton but he did beat him um I think that there's nothing that Lewis has done wrong to be behind Jimmy Clark. Let me be clear about that. I I think he'd say the same thing. I think that Jimmy Clark is one of those borderline deity drivers. When you talk about the people who raced against him, uh, we asked Hobbs about this over the summer. I asked him this question, and he said, without a doubt, the greatest driver he ever saw was Jimmy Clark. He said, you had to be lucky and good to beat him. And usually it just meant that his car was broken on the side of the road. That means my number one is Juan Manuel Fangio. There you go. The godfather. I, I cannot imagine the numbers he could have put up if F1 existed when he was in his prime. But his body of work, I think, speaks for itself at five championships. And the win percentage, it is, it is absolutely off the charts. It's clear that he was a driver without any peers. And at age 47, I think he was bored and retired. Mm. He was a driver so good that he was kidnapped by Cuban revolutionaries. That's right. I forgot that. Yes. Ahead of the Cuban Grand Prix, which was a non-F1 points race. It wasn't a points race. It was a non-championship uh, race. He was kidnapped and treated well because they loved the guy. Oh, yeah. But they, they wanted to raise global attention to the uh, to the regime that they were protesting. So... I can't think of a driver that tips the scale that hard in terms of just how out of everyone else's league they were. I think both all three drivers in my top three you could say that about, and you could also it's a strong argument. You could also say that about Schumacher uh, to an extent. Uh, the Ferrari was just so dominant, and to to echo what David Hobbs said, the car argument is kind of moot because the best drivers are always in the best cars. I can't I can't really name. It's. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's hard for me to name a champion in any, a season champion in any form of auto racing who didn't drive, maybe not the best car, but one of the best cars out there. The only example I could come up with in kind of the modern era of sport was Alan Kowicki. Yeah, that's that's a real He had no good point. Ford. 
I could think I mean, of some he, truck or Xfinity ones, but that's a different He took the Thunderbird level. off the and just had Underbird because Ford wasn't giving him any money, yeah. and it was kind of an underdog he thing. He knocked off Bill Elliott and Davey Allison it in their huge, prime with but big that, money. That was and, the only one that I yeah. could think of. Yeah, you don't get upset champions the best very car. Often. No. Yeah. Um, by the way, Frank, uh, huge thanks to Frank Wilson for corresponding via email Absolutely. about this. He put Michael Schumacher in fifth, okay. Juan Manuel Fangio in fourth. Lewis Hamilton, third, Jimmy Clark, second, and Ayrton Senna, P1. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to have Senna and Clark in their number one spot ahead of the more modern-day drivers. And just for fun, I just tabulated when you gave me your your list. I tabulated if we used old Grand Prix scoring, 10 points for a win, 8th for second, 7, 6, 5 point system. (laughs) If we were to take the average of us three experts, the greatest driver of all time— is Jimmy Clark. Jimmy Clark yep. with 23 out of a possible 30 points in this poll. Tied for second was Hamilton and Senna. Then Juan Manuel Fangio at 21 points. Schumacher at 20. There were only three points separating when you, when you took that average it's out. Crazy. So uh, it, it all kind of comes out in the wash. You could make a great case for any of those five drivers, I think. I think the top five is pretty clear to me. And then that's when you start getting into opinion and – for me, I don't know what Lewis has to do to pass Jimmy or or Juan Manuel. It might be a hundred wins and eight titles. I feel like he's being held back because he's in the modern era. Yeah, and in it, your mind. Yeah, I think so. And it's because there are so many races, and we have such a great sample size that it's like it, that's the part that's so crazy about Lewis is you put him under that microscope, and it all still holds up. Yeah, that's what I can't believe. Maybe he maybe he does deserve to be higher. Obviously, we wanted to hear from you before we did this, fans, so that we could compare your lists and give you a shout-out. But guess what? Tell us now how you were wrong. Now you've heard ours, and you've probably fired up and decided to push the buttons and become a keyboard warrior. We still want you to do that. So re- retweet us, send us a message, at Racing Snobs is our Twitter handle, and we'll read it uh, next week on the air when we uh, review the Brazilian Grand Prix. Once again, our picks for that, and then we're going to get to a real quick uh, Morse code. Oh, we can save that for next week. There's nothing in here that we'll, well no, keep for a week in the fridge. You sure? Oh yeah, yeah. This I've got some WEC stuff, some Le Mans news, some supercars. Talk a little bit about Alonzo, but there's nothing burning a hole in my pocket. Let's just save that for next week. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. So Eric has Max Verstappen to win the Brazilian Grand Prix. He likes uh, Nico Hulkenberg to be his midfield MVP. I'm going to go with Lewis Hamilton on this one. It was between him and Vettel. And I'll go with Lando Norris, the birthday boy, to be the best of the rest. Again, I feel like for whatever reason, Interlagos reminds me of of Austin. I don't know why it does uh, circuit to the Americas. They, uh, I know why. Lando was ridiculously Left hand, fast first corner. There. It's an it's a uh, anti clockwise track. There aren't Maybe many that's of those. It. I and think that's why. Lando was super fast, which also means look out for Albon because he was super fast. He's got the contract now. Let's see what he does. All right. We got to get out of here. Let's play the music for Eric Morris. I'm Tony Rizzuti. Thanks for joining us on American Racing Stops. Subscribe to the podcast one on Apple and Spotify and do Send us your top five, your top ten. We want to know who you think is the greatest Formula One driver of all time. See ya.